Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Kevin, Paul Thiessen, and Ali Samjabi. Coming up on DTNS, how well can smartwatches detect heart issues? Twitter theatrics continue, whether we like them or not. And Patrick Norton is here with Home Theater Gift Guides. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, November 18th, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From somewhere in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. Drawing the top tech stories in Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, we do have quite a show for y'all. Uh, we're going to talk about gift guides. We're going to talk about Twitter melting down. But first, let's start with the quick hits. The U.S. Federal Communications Commission introduced new rules requiring Internet service providers to display easy-to-read labels with key facts about products at the point of sale. They look like nutrition labels and should include base price, itemized additional fees, speed, and any data allowances. Also, the Indian Space Research Organization successfully launched the country's first privately developed vehicle, the Vikram S, suborbital rocket developed by Skyroot Aerospace. Skyroot developed the six meter long rocket over the last two years, and it carried payloads for three customers. Nice. Bloomberg sources say that the U.S. government continues to seek information on agreements Elon Musk may have made with foreign investors who hold stakes in Twitter after his acquisition of the company, specifically around access to user data. Earlier this week, the U.S. Treasury Department, which leads the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., said it saw no need for such an investigation. We will be talking about Twitter a little later in the show. But first, Japan's Fuji News Network reports authorities arrested Sonic the Hedgehog's co-creator, Nuji Naka, on insider trading charges. The charges involve Naka allegedly buying 10,000 shares on the developer network Aimlean prior to the public announcement of the Dragon Quest Tact mobile game it was jointly developing with Square Enix. Raised some eyebrows, obviously. Naka previously worked with Square Enix between 2018 and 2021. Samsung added support for Latin American Spanish to its Bixby virtual assistant. Some of you are using Bixby, so you're probably going to be excited about that. Samsung said that the Galaxy S22 and S21 lineups, as well as the Z Fold 4 and Z Flip 4, get support now, with more older devices getting support coming in December. Brazilian Portuguese was the only Latin American language supported by Bixi until now. All right, Patrick, let's talk about hearts, shall we? I have a lot of hearts. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and, who should, and who shouldn't? A new study from the Mayo Clinic focused on whether or not the Apple Watch's ECG feature can detect heart abnormalities, such as left ventricular dysfunction. If you're not familiar with that, an ECG monitor measures and records your heart rate and its rhythm and displays that information in a wave-like pattern that you can either use for yourself, share with your doctor, etc. However... Certain abnormalities are often undiagnosed because they don't show symptoms, but they can be followed by very serious medical issues like congestive heart failure. Nobody wants that. So looking at 2,454 patients across 12 countries and including 124,000 ECGs from Apple Watch data between August 2021 and February of this year, the researchers' findings indicate that consumer watch ECGs acquired in non-clinical environments can indeed identify patients with cardiac dysfunction or who might have that in the future. An AI algorithm used in the study is currently being reviewed by the FDA, so that's not happening yet, but it is in review. But the full study results and discoveries were published in Nature Medicine this week, which will be in our show notes. I thought this was pretty fascinating. I mean, I, I wear an Apple Watch. I'm not totally worried about uh, her stuff, uh, Patrick. <laughs> worried about lots of other things. But uh, what do you make of this? So I look at this and I think two things. One, this is amazing, uh, you know, because there's been all sorts of heart issues in various branches of my family and people I've known and all that kind of stuff. And on the other hand, I'm like, oh, this is going to 
send a whole nother flood of people trying to figure out if they have, you know, what they have and, and searching maybe not the best vetted websites for medical information. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm curious, um, you know, cause this is, this is really kind of like tricorder zone where it's like, I have a handheld device that will allow me to run an electrocardiogram. This used to take, you know, hours in a hospital and blah, 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 or, you know, a doctor's office. And so it's really slick. Um, but that there's a really, you know, thin or maybe a really wide but kind of amorphous line between this is a medical product that has been certified by medical professionals and testing and we made a thing that acts like that other thing um, that requires a doctor and you can do this at home. So I'm really, really curious to see. I haven't had a chance to play around with one of these yet. Um, it might be horrifying. It might cause me to immediately go to a doctor. But I'm very, 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 very curious to see what, you know, what the what the kind of studies say about this over the next few years as they kind of examine how these work, how well they work in the real world. You know, does it save lives? Does it just cause all sorts of people panicking and going to the doctor? I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that good point. Um, I, I, I'm with you. I am one of those people who will go to WebMD, you know, anytime I'm like, hmm, my left right. arm feels weirdly numb. Am I dying? Kind of thing. And yeah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and not necessarily nefarious, but just information that is not helpful to you as right. a person who really needs to go to a medical professional. That said, uh, for folks who are wearing not only an Apple Watch, there are certainly uh, a variety of other handheld devices that do ECG or EKG uh, uh, functionalities that it feels to me like, you know, even if I were to get like a alert, like, you know, you might want to see your doctor. Right. Maybe, maybe there's nothing to it. Maybe there is something more to it. But the fact that the study showed that well it was it was definitely picking up on things that other people were going to have problems with down the road hard to say no no I, like hundreds of thousands of people like i think you know several hundred thousand people die every year from heart related disease or heart disease so anything that helps slow that down like oh here's a fantastic cdc.gov stat every year about 805,000 people in the united states have a heart attack um so, you know, let's uh, anything that makes it better or easier for people to find out they have a problem before it turns into a heart attack. I got to say that's a good thing. Yeah, me too. Me too. All right. Well, uh, uh, let's talk about things we might want to buy for the holiday season. <laughs> On Monday, we talked to uh, Trisha Hirschberger about gift uh, shopping for gamers this holiday season. What does the gamer that you love in your life want uh, as a gift, but would you get that special somebody, <laughs> you know, could be your adversary. I don't know who wants the best audio from a home theater setup or just a great way to listen to their music. Patrick, you deal with this stuff all the time on AVXL. That's what you and Robert Aaron do best. So what are your gift recommendations for these folks? Oh my goodness. So, uh, my partner in AVXL home audio theater mayhem or home theater mayhem, Robert Heron, he's going to be on next week. I think Monday to talk yeah. about best deals mm -hmm. on TVs. So if we laugh like, you know, 50% of home theater is, is video and 50% of home theater is audio. And all too many people experience home theater. I might even say 90% of some movies and television shows is audio. I am probably exaggerating because I like the speakers and the headphones, but Audio is a huge part, especially in, in the age of Dolby Atmos. Audio is a huge part of the experience. And if you don't have a decent set of speakers, you're missing out on some really spectacular work by some really creative people. Um, yes, your TV probably has speakers and they probably suck. I mean, sound comes out of them. You can figure out what people are saying. There's kind of a thing that might sound like an explosion, but I, I, and I am mocking them, but generally speaking, speakers are kind of an afterthought. They're what is, they are stuffed in the space that is left over from the rest of, of the engineering and moving up to a simple sound bar or a decent set of stereo speakers will be a big step up for almost every television out there. Or you can go for the ultimate, which is a full surround sound system. Um, you know, it can, you don't have to spend And when a lot you of money. say surround sound, you're talking about like 5.1. Yeah. Like a center channel, a left and right speaker, yeah. rear channels. If you really want to do it up, Dolby elevation speakers or Dolby overhead speakers. But, um, 
you know, if you don't want to spend a lot of money or you don't want to get complicated, um, just recycle a set of computer speakers or garage sale speakers and amp. Um, Clips Pro Media 2.1. These speakers have been around forever. They sound decent. They're 150 bucks. You know, if you can figure out a way to get the audio from your television into these speakers, they will probably be a major upgrade from the speakers inside of the television, right? Um, sound bars have gotten incredibly sophisticated. Uh, I've been amazed when an entry level video. Vizio soundbar. Uh, like they cost under 200 bucks for the entry level ones, and they do a very good job of bringing you the sound experience. And soundbars are also, when I say sophisticated, there are a lot of soundbars that are doing, you know, uh, Dolby Atmos. They are doing legit Dolby Atmos with up firing speakers. They are sort of synthesizing Dolby Atmos through processing to give you a larger sound stage or more impressive sound stage. Um, you know, Something like uh, Vizio's M512A, uh, it's a sound bar, it has real channels, it has a sub. It's not a sub like it's going to shake your house, but it's a sub like you're going to feel the, you know, the music down to 40 or 50 hertz, and it's going to be impressive, and it's got up-firing Atmos speakers. It's like four or $500. That is going to be an amazing upgrade from the speakers that are in your television. Um, the folks at Wirecutter, they have really good things to say about JBL's bar 2.1 deep bass. I haven't had a chance to hear that. It doesn't have real channels, but it is going to give you a good front sound stage and really solid low end. Um, um, but, but but on the subject of sound sure. bars, I had a friend uh, who knew that we were going to be talking about this today and, and <laughs> is, is kind of putting together their new apartment and was like, is Sono still the sound bar to get? And I was like, well, I mean, it's an expensive sound bar to get, but it sounds like Sonos has a lot of competition now. There is a lot of competition, right? So Sonos is not inexpensive. By the time you get a sound bar and a couple of, uh, you know, play one type speakers for the back, I shouldn't call them play ones, or uh, some of my favorite, these sort of panel speakers that there's a, there's a Ikea Sonos Symphonisk speaker that's essentially a picture speaker that's incredibly friendly for wall mounting and actually sounds shockingly good. Um, Sonos, I would buy Sonos if I was invested in the Sonos environment. We have... One, two, three, four, five, six, probably eight Sonos, you know, kind of friendly streaming devices in our house, right? Because that's what's in the boys' bedrooms. We have the yeah. idea lamps. Yeah. We have a couple of the speakers in the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, the bedroom. Uh, and I have the ability to run the stuff through an amp and a set of speakers downstairs. For us, Sonos... It was amazing because I, I set up the Sonos system and I got our MP3 collection hooked up to it. Then I got Spotify hooked up to it. And it changed the way everybody in my family listened to music in a really positive way because it made it easy to stream music anywhere at the house of a pretty good quality. Um, the sound bars are actually really good. Robert Heron uses a Sonos sound bar in his house and he is in love with it. Um, they have an optional subwoofer you can add on to that. They just came out with a sub mini recently that is actually pretty good. Um, the big sub's a little boomy, but if you want movies or you love the uh, the booty shaking bass lines, uh, yeah. it is it <laughs> is a delight. If you don't have series. downstairs neighbors, yeah, that's a know? big one. Downstairs neighbors, <laughs> but it's kind of amazing if you go with with a, the beam or the arc and a couple of uh, Sonos One speakers for the surround sounds. It is really nice. It's a little more spendy than a lot of of uh, them, you know, and it's. A toss up if you're in the sonos environment i'd say absolutely get a sonos soundbar if you're not in the sonos environment and you start getting that 800 to 1200 dollar range i start being like mm, start spend a little bit more and start thinking about separate speakers and an av receiver um it's uh brent butterworth uh, a writer audio reviewer writer um bass player actually jazz bass player fantastic human being um I really like his work. He did a really nice set of testing with what I will affectionately call not stupid, crazy home theater geeks like me titled, can a good sound bar rival a true surround sound system in a blind listening test? Go to the wire cutter, read that article because it talks about what happens when you go from a sound bar, which is a block of speakers in a box mounted under or over your, your television set versus having a distinct and separate and hopefully, you know, appropriately spaced out left speaker, right speaker and center channel and center channel being separate from the left and right speakers really open up the sound stage or the experience in some really cool ways, especially if you have rear surround sounds there. Um, you know, uh, I, I think a great place to start is Elac's debut 2.0 speakers uh, and center channel paired, uh, basically entry level 5.1 4K ready AV receiver, Denon's AVR S540BT. 
great pace to start for 5.1 surround sound. Uh, you know, once you have that 5.1, the three front channels, the two rear channels, the next thing and a subwoofer, the next thing to think about is overhead speakers or what they call, uh, uh, you know, Dolby Atmos elevation speakers where they're up firing speakers. And if you want to talk about that, do me a favor, email askdavexl.com <laughs> because Sarah and I don't have enough time to get into the, all the delightful things to consider. But Atmos in a well-installed uh, room, like Atmos, Dolby Atmos, is amazing. Like, I don't care about the 6th, the 7th, the ninth, and the 11th speakers in a surround sound system, but if you instead of adding more speakers around you, you do those speakers above you or up firing, it's a pretty amazing experience when it's set up properly. A real quick for anybody who says, well, you know, I'm I'm interested in building out my home theater, but I'm also really interested in the best headphones. Um, <laughs> I know I know I have my thoughts, but real quick, uh, what what would you point people towards? Oh my goodness, uh, I have a list in the rundown. Cut me off at any time. Yes, uh, it'll be in our show notes. It, it, I'm sure there's a lot of information here. I have too many. I love headphones, right? So you got 20 bucks for $17. Mono prices, premium hi-fi DJ style over the ear pro headphones. I'm pretty sure Roger Chang is wearing a set of these right now. If not, I'd bet money he's wearing a pair of Sony's MDR 7506s. Uh, that is a fantastic headphone. I've owned them for years and years and years. That's Wirecutter's best headphone under $100. I'm also a big fan of Bayer Dynamics DT770. Some people call them ugly. I call them wonderful. They're bulletproof. Uh, you know, they are a studio staple for professional uh, studios. They're 140 on Amazon right now. Uh, they are fantastic. If you want to start getting into sort of audiophile stuff, um, Monolith's Monoprice M565C. They are a closed back, which means, you know, it keeps the sound inside the headphone over mm -hmm. ear. Planar magnetic. Planar magnetic is a basically a thin strip of material that they run electricity through, uh, you know, strips of metal that are bonded to the thin material. Um, they start doing really spectacular things, especially with music that has a lot of high end or cymbals and, and, and orchestral music. Um, can I keep going or should we just point people to the website? Because I got more. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. I, I wish we did have more. Um, what uh, what Patrick has uh, 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 given us is quite a few links. So if anything yeah. has tickled your fancy in <laughs> any of the conversations that we had over the last yeah. few minutes, do check out our show notes uh, because – there's a lot of information here, and I think I think the takeaway is one size doesn't fit all. You no. might, you know, it might be that you know you're on a budget. It might be that you want the best audio. Yeah, well, it might be that you know there's a comfort fit. You I know that. Uh, appeals to you. I got a list of the best kind of neutral, fairly comfortable headphones from 20 bucks up to like a $900 set of Dan Clark audio Aeon twos and even something more expensive than that. If you're really feeling unhinged. So go forth, go forth. Make music sound better. <laughs> well, as you do go forth, uh, Patrick, uh, <laughs> Twitter, where do we begin with oh the goodness. week that was Twitter? Uh, we, we have, we have covered Twitter and there are days that we haven't covered Twitter on DTNS because it seemed more businessy <laughs> than tech, but here we are. Uh, so le let's just run it down. Uh, we'll start with the Verge's coverage that earlier this week, Twitter owner Elon Musk fired dozens of employees who criticized or mocked him in tweets and internal messages. This is coming right. from the employees. Uh, then he set a deadline of 5 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday. That would be yesterday for anybody who's listening live for all employees to either respond yes on a Google form that they wanted to stay uh, for what he's calling Twitter 2.0 or not. Otherwise, leave the company. Receive I a just, severance package. Uh, yeah, that. I mean – this was he was like, we're going to be hardcore and making Twitter 2.0 and we're going to live in the office and we're going to eat flat food, sit under our doors. And I'm exaggerating, but not by a lot. And no. basically commit to this by signing up in the Google form. Or if you don't, we're going to give you three months severance. And the rumors that are showing up in some fairly major sites is that something like 1,200 people out of the 3,750-ish left Who were remaining. the layoffs mm -hmm. were like, bye. Yeah. Um, Very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, many of those folks are talking to various publications who are taking stock of this. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and they locked all the employees out until Monday. Right. <laughs> um, 
that was uh, something that Bloomberg reported uh, that Musk um, Sorry, has at I... least on some level <laughs> reversed this whole no more working from home policy, which, you know, a lot of people were like, are you kidding? I like the <laughs> look at all the Twitter employees across the world. We all have to go into an office. Um, well, there are fewer of them now, but um, an email that was sent today, um, quote, Regarding remote work, all that is required for approval is that your manager takes responsibility for ensuring that you are making an excellent contribution. It's also expected that you have in-person meetings with your colleagues on a reasonable cadence, ideally weekly, but not less than once per month. At risk of stating the obvious, any manager who falsely claims that somebody reporting to them is doing excellent work or that a given role is essential, whether remote or not will be exited from the company. That seems like the kind of thing you shouldn't I have mean, Patrick, I think you and I have had some <sighs> crappy bosses in the past, but this is taking a cake I, of, uh, yeah. of some kind. I was... Okay, so we've both been through a Warren Act firing, right? Which kind of comes down to 60 days notice or 60 days pay to grossly oversimplify. It's a longer period of time in New York. It is a thing. Um... And uh, the whole process of this has just been so brutal and so unpleasant. And the reaction has been pretty harsh, um, both, I think, uh, you know, in the Twitterverse and actually the reaction, not to get businessy, but the reaction to the Tesla stock. Because I feel like a lot of Tesla investors are like, shouldn't you be making cars instead of tanking Twitter? Um, and But that's, right, but that's right. what people are saying is that they've lost so many, you know, they, they, li they literally had days uh it is not a particular exaggeration to say they had not that many hours to put together the list of people they were cutting out of a incredibly large group of people and i get it you want to do staff reductions you have to change things you've you've got you know a billion dollars a year in debt you know payments to make you've you've just spent 44 billion dollars for a company that's never actually really made money i can get where you would be like we're going to cut expenses right now um but you know, I I feel like they're in a position where they slashed a lot of people and then they did a lot of things that were really unpleasant uh, or unkind to a lot of critical employees who, who may even, despite the cooling down of tech employment in the Bay Area, have options. And now they're looking around and probably the speculation is, you know, this is a complicated code base that you know, according to people who are being quoted in in relatively legit publications, has requires a lot of maintenance to keep it functioning. Um, Indeed. And that's, you know, that's the big question. Will Twitter stay up? Will Twitter collapse? You know, will Elon have a fit of peak and shut it down? Well, and, you know, if, if you, I don't know if, if, if you hang out on Twitter as much as I do, uh, you know, as of last night, 9 p.m. Pacific time before I just you know, shut my computer off and said no more for me, um, it uh, it sounded like. Oh, well, we'll see if this if this if this um, whole platform e even stands tomorrow. Right. It is standing. It is. But uh, one of the most recent um, notes comes from the New York Times. This was uh, pretty uh, soon before we started the show. Sources from the NYT saying that internal estimates show that about 1,200 full-time Twitter employees resigned on Thursday. This is in reaction to Elon Musk saying, are you in Twitter 2.0 or are you out? Um, Twitter had about you know, 37 staff uh, after the mass layoff. So if you're kind of going, all right, so of the 3,700, if uh, 1,200, and, you know, there, there's probably some uh, leeway on, on those numbers, have walked away, we are getting into weird territory. Yeah. We're getting into weird territory here. I, and, yeah. Yeah. The, it's, uh, I, 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 I just want to say good luck. Uh, I hope everybody who has been, you know, booted from Twitter or has chosen to exit at Twitter is well taken care of and has good options. Um, cause that, you know, again, Sarah and I have been through it a whole bunch of times. It's never fun. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, good luck and Hey, hopefully the remaining engineering staff, 
uh, you know, maybe hopefully the code base is more robust than people are implying and the remaining staff is able to keep it going. And who knows what it's going to be? Because, yeah, I don't even want to mention things involving, you know, little blue check marks and impersonations and all that. I, other mayhem. I mean, we could be here all day. True. Truly. All week. <laughs> <laughs> all day, all week, all month. I don't want to be here all year. But if you are feeling social, um, we, we do still have a Twitter account, uh, which we use, DTNS show on twitter we're also on tiktok at daily tech news show and dtns picks p-i-x on instagram all right let's hand it off to our very own tom merritt now for a deep dive into accessibility in video games Pretty much everybody likes playing video games, right? But not everybody can use the stock controllers on offer. Thankfully, video game accessibility is getting a lot more attention these days. And Steve Saylor is leading that push as a video game accessibility consultant who's worked with developers like Naughty Dog and Microsoft. Uh, Steve, welcome to DTNS. Hey, thank you so much for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So what are some of the common issues that video accessibility can address? A lot of it mostly comes down to just trying to be able to break down the barriers uh, for uh, that disabled players have to basically uh, go through on a day-to-day -day basis and still keep in the same challenge uh, that a video game provides. I mean, otherwise, it basically just be like watching a movie. So a lot of times, uh, people with uh, who are deaf, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, blind, low vision, those with motor disabilities, or even those with cognitive disabilities, um, what we try to be able to do is basically make it so that some of those uh, disabilities Abilities that or barriers that they have in the, uh, that uh, in everyday life essentially can be able to be uh, uh, removed, and uh, whether that's through design or through options uh, in whatever game they want to play. So, how do you approach that from the developer side? What kind of what kind of things do you need to do? Um, there's several things you can do. It's a lot of it comes down to education um, because a lot, not every developer either knows someone that has a disability or just knows what to specifically do. Sure, so there sure. are guidelines and, and uh, resources that are provided online uh, that are freely available and also some that are uh, paid uh, that essentially you can be able to tap into to learn more about it. It's also being able to talk to consultants like myself that have a disability that live it day to day that they can be able to offer suggestions and feedback that developers may not under, uh, understand or know uh, or about. And then essentially it's about basically starting it from the very beginning. Um, as many times as developers, as you start a project, you have the ability to be able to have also almost unlimited budget, unlimited resources. And the earlier you can start with accessibility the uh, and you design with everyone in mind, then essentially it makes it a lot easier down the road to, uh, to be able to either tweak or to be able to get feedback and be able to try to be able to make a, a more whole accessible experience. Yeah, that makes sense. Get get in early, right? Uh, yeah. So so that you're budgeted in <laughs> from the beginning, and you're not you're not trying to add something on at the end. Um, on the other side, on on the infrastructure side, I think a lot of people who are unfamiliar with accessibility look at a game controller. In fact, some people forget accessibility, look at a game controller, and go, "That's a lot of buttons. <laughs> how, how do I take take advantage of that? How do you translate things like thumbsticks and D pads and and all of that sort of thing?" Uh, well, it depends because uh, sometimes uh, there are definitely players that can't even use a controller in sort of the common, uh, whether it's like a DualSense uh, controller from PlayStation or an Xbox controller uh, uh, on the Series X or even Nintendo. And it's kind of evolved mostly just from how we used to have controllers in the 80s and hasn't really evolved in regards to accessibility. So a lot of times it really kind of comes down to being able to provide freedom and customization that if you need to be able to play with a controller that either vertically instead of horizontally or play with mm -hmm. one handed um, or to be able to utilize essentially what uh, hardware like uh, what Xbox has, which is the Xbox adaptive controller, which uh, provides uh, like you can set up uh, buttons and switches and toggles that uh, those with motor disabilities can essentially be able to use. And then having other people to be able to kind of uh, play with you kind of using uh, systems called co-pilot, where essentially you can kind of combine uh, multiple controllers into one controller and allows more people to be able to kind of play at the same time uh, if there are certain controls that a disabled player can't be able to utilize or uh, be able to kind of fully uh, use. It, it seems like you'd have to make sure 
that inputs on the designer and are standardized then so that depending on what system is being used, it's it's still going to translate into the game. Is is there an industry standard on that sort of thing? Not currently. And that's something that we in the disabled or, or at least in the accessibility community, we don't necessarily try to encourage because if there is like a sort of a, sa a standard set of like, here's all the options you should have, then it just becomes a checklist and people uh, and developers may not want to be able to just to move past that checklist. And because everyone wants to be able to make their game as different as possible that uh, to kind of stand out from the crowd. Every game is different and every uh, game also provides new challenges for disabled players. Sure, so sure. there are sort of a certain standard like stuff like offering subtitle options and customization for controls or having a large text size like that stuff can be kind of universal for the most part. But um, we always try to encourage that it's not necessarily about what standard options that you can have in a game, but it's more about trying to design an accessible experience. Got it, got it. I know we have some some small uh, or, or, or sometimes beginning uh, game developers in the audience. Uh, I think for them, it's like, well, it's easy for Naughty Dog to do this. They've got tons of resources. How how does a small, maybe independent, solo game developer address accessibility themselves? Uh, actually, it's a really great question because kind of the common myth is that if you're an independent developer and you don't have a lot of mon uh, money to, to provide for budget or resources, that accessibility is difficult to do. But in reality, you can actually be able to do a lot more for accessibility than a AAA can. Like AAA, you have managers, you have a lot of red tape that you would have to go through just to get uh, any approval on trying to be able to try try out uh, a new thing, whereas an indie developer, there's less red tape. So essentially, they can just kind of go in, try a bunch of different things, and it would make them a lot more efficient in trying to be able to make things more accessible. Plus, also, there are uh, free resources, like there is a video game accessibility guidelines um, that you can be able to search up on, on Google. Xbox provides them as well, and there actually are uh, testing services that Xbox provides at any given point in the development process that is specifically for independent developers that, hey, we, can, we just want to make sure that your game is accessible we'll test it we'll help you out we'll provide guidelines and all of that um is either up to like from free or you can be able to pay xbox even to be able to have that kind of uh, access to their service ah fantastic steve thank you so much uh for sharing your insights and expertise on this if folks want to follow more of what what you do where should they go uh, yeah, you can be able to follow me uh, on Twitter at Steve Saylor or uh, Twitch, twitch.tv slash blindgamersteve or on my YouTube channel where I do a lot of accessibility reviews and previews, uh, youtube.com slash snowball. Well, uh, going on with the thank yous, because <laughs> we have a lot of people who contributed to the show today. Uh, we'd like to thank Len Peralta. Len, it's so nice to see you again. What have you been drawing for us? Well, you know, um, next week here in the United States, it's the Thanksgiving holiday. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we ended up talking a little about Twitter. And that's I sort of did a mashup of, uh, of Thanksgiving and Twitter. Uh, this one's called Is the Bird Done? And uh, <laughs> oh goodness! Um, I you know after last night's meltdown, I'm not really sure is that, where is it's that going. Like arugula under the bird? It's like or, lettuce, possibly. Yeah, I don't know. Something. Yeah, you all know, kinds of good it's, stuff. It's, you but, know, whatever uh, you make of it. Yeah. So for all those uh, exited uh, Twitter employees, uh, if you'd like to uh, order this, uh, you actually, if you're a Patreon of mine, you get this right now, patreon.com forward slash Len, or you can go the old fashioned route, which is uh, LenPeraltaStore.com. Uh, you can order it. It arrives right in your mailbox or your digital mailbox, whatever you have. Um, I'm also doing uh, custom drawn uh, holiday cards. So you may want to consider those as well. But um, uh, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. There happy you go. Thanksgiving to you too, Len. And, 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 and you as well, Patrick Norton. Let folks Thank know so where they can keep up with what you're up to. Well, twitter.com slash Patrick Norton until the Twitter apocalypse. What are we going to call it when it goes down? If it goes down, I hope it doesn't go down. Uh, otherwise, avxl.com is the best place to find me uh, or search for avexcel on your favorite podcatcher. You can listen to Robert Heron and I talk about home theater and audio. You don't want to miss it. Um, thanks to both of you for being with us today. Also, special thanks to Ariadne Specs, who is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Ariadne. 
Speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We roll into it right after uh, DTNS wraps up. But just a reminder, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we hope you all have a great weekend. We'll be back on Monday talking TV deals with Robert Heron. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer, Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Docking. Dr. Nikki Ackermans, social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterdin, our mods Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, BioCow, Cap Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, JD Galloway. Mod and hosting, video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show include Shannon Morse, Justin Robert Young, and Patrick Norton. Guests on this week's show included Trisha Hirschberger and Steve Saylor. Thanks to all our patrons who make this show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>